how does a doctrine of universalism distort all aspects of our lives? How do we see those tendencies in our culture playing itself out in, in church practice and church life? Um, and conversely, if, if we were to write the ship, so to speak, what sort of different church practices would we expect to see? Um, I would start the question, or I start answering that by going back to something I'd said earlier. You, you talk about what do you, how does that work itself out in church practice or worship, right? I think once you start moving towards a universalism and rejection of hell, what you're rejecting is the wrath of God. We don't, we don't want to have room for a God of wrath. And again, what I would say is when you reject the wrath of God, you ultimately start to reject the love of God. I'm thinking of Psalm 136 where, um, you know, the love of God endures forever. The love of God endures forever over and over and over again, right? And it's, um, but, but when, it, you know, you delivered us out of the land of Egypt, the love of the Lord endures forever. You, but then you go through it and some of it, a lot of it's like you, def you, you crushed the king of, you know, so-and-so, the, the love of God endures forever. You defeated Og, the love of God endures forever. In other words, your judgment upon our enemies is your expression of your lo our love, your love to us. And, you know, I think you see this, and you would speak to it better than I can, but like the trajectory of you, you deny the wrath of God, and ultimately you're going to end up denying God and the love of God altogether. You start off trying to protect the love of God, right? That's, what, that's, what, that's the, maybe the, the benign good impulse that drives someone like a Rob Bell towards a universalist perspective, mm -hmm. is you want to amplify the love of God. But by removing God's wrath, you actually begin to remove his love yeah. in the end. And so the love that wins isn't, isn't love, biblical love. Yeah, it's, and it ends up not becoming even like, you, you chase it out long enough and there is no God anymore that loves. I mean, you look in, the, look in the universalist churches now and that's not even the God of the Bible anymore that loves. It's a, it's a very different creation. I think we see this in, in everyday life. Take a child, you love a, a, a little, little girl named Emily. Uh, but you're, maybe you're a parent, maybe you're an uncle, uh, uh, related somehow to the child. You're, you're making efforts for education, caring for the child, protecting and everything. Now, if you should come back to the house where Emily lives and, and no one is with her, but there's someone who is striking the child, harming the child, your yep. response, because yep. of your love, is going to be intense opposition, intense Absolutely wrath, right. indignation. You're going to thrust yourself in the situation to deliver that child yep. from the harm that is coming upon her. Yep. You can't separate love from hatred. Right. This is one of the insights of Jonathan Edwards in his uh -huh. treatise on religious affections, that, that holy love also applied to holy hatred. Not for the very same thing, but that, that one who, who loved God and loved another person would also love what is in opposition to God or in opposition to, to human welfare. Yeah. So it's, it's naive to think that, uh, that, you know, that life is just a great love fest. You know, there's, no, there's no place for wrath, there's no place for indignation, because those two things are actually are tied together. Yeah. So I think you lose, you ultimately like chase it out long enough, you're going to lose Christianity altogether, I think is what's gonna happen, which I think is what hist historically bears itself out. But in terms of kind of like the incremental steps that you begin to see along the way, I, you know, I, I think the, um, you, you lose hell, you lose atonement. And when you lose atonement, you've lost sin, you've lost the, what is so much in the, the biblical data of like gratitude to God for the redemption that he's brought. Um, that, you, that, that begins to recede from your mm -hmm. kind of corporate worship experience because there isn't that same sense of, of gratitude, I would think. And, and, uh, like just, and I think I would, again, think too, like the, the transcendence of God um, that I, I'm thinking, uh, we may have to cut this. This might be too long ago, but we'll give it a nope. shot. But um, <laughs> the, the, uh, there's that movie, The Patriot, which gets to the, to the very illustration that you just gave. I don't know if you've seen the movie or not, but, but you know, Mel Gibson's character, his, his son is killed by this British officer. It's during the Revolutionary War. And, um, and, and you know, Mel Gibson's character, of course, as he always does in, in his movies, you know, he, he grabs a couple of his younger sons who are like maybe eight and ten, you know, and he waylays this British regiment that's taking one of his other sons off to be executed. And um, after you've seen the murder of, of the character's son, you're filled with just like this righteous indignation, like something must be done to save this other son who's now about to suffer the same fate. And the, the little boys watch their dad wipe out this British regiment to save their brother. And in the end, they're like, they're, they're like horrified, but yet like awestruck at the same time, right? Like his, like Mel Gibson's in that movie, his love was so fierce that it like evoked a sense of like 
fear almost in his other children, mm -hmm. but yet at the same time, the way the movie plays itself out is really well done, I think, where it's like fear and awe and admiration all wrapped together at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's something that like happens in wrath. Like when you see Jesus in, Re in Revelation 19 coming back with the blood all over his clothing, having treaded the wine press of, of God's wrath, like you're both, you know how much he loves you and it's almost frightening how much he loves you, that he would like do that, you know? And I think you lose that sense of worship in a universalist mindset. You don't have that same sense of awe of, mm -hmm. of God's like, like unrelenting love. Like there's a, there's a place in the Psalms, I forget where it is, where God says, I've given men in exchange for your life. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's a, like, wow, do I want to be loved that much? You know, but like God loves that much. It's, uh, it's almost scary how much he loves. And I think you lose the, the sense of fear almost. In, in a, a church that's characterized by uh, an emphasis on simply on the love of God in which the elements of judgment and wrath are taken out, you don't have salvation as rescue. Right. What you have, if there is salvation, it's enhancement. Yeah. My life is really pretty good, but it, I could kind of be raised up to a somewhat higher level. Yeah. And so this is where we have the church that focuses on the seminars, on you know, how to have a better marriage, how to raise happy children, how to have a successful life as a, as a single adult, whatever yeah. it may be. Um, yeah. And there's no message that says that cuts through that and says essentially there's something radically wrong with us that can only come, can only be rectified by, uh, by a savior. Yeah. Kierkegaard, the, the Danish philosopher I quoted before, talked about the two different, he called religion A and religion B in this work called The Philosophical Friday. Religion A was, uh, that said basically we already have the truth within us and we need a teacher to help to draw the truth out of us. Religion B said, no, actually we are destitute. We need, no, we need a teacher, we need a savior. It's like, or someone used the analogy of like falling overboard on ship. Well, I guess if you can swim, you can kind of swim your way back. Someone on, on the ship could kind of give you lessons. Oh, move your arms like this. It's called the Australian crawl, right? Well, if you don't swim at all, you're flailing your arms, right? You need someone to dive off of the boat and get into the water, grab you, pull you out uh, from the water, rescue you. And so there's a, a radical difference uh, in, in, in what salvation means depend on what you assume about the human condition. Yeah. It sounds familiar to uh, you ended or nearly ended your lecture talking about Jeep Grace yesterday. And it seems like that is something very much in the evangelical culture where we think that a certain basic confession of faith grants us salvation. In fact, I've heard many a Christian say, uh, I understood salvation, but then I needed to understand this Christian life thing. Mm -hmm. You know, opens the door for all these sort of enhancement sort of ideas that you're talking about. What is this, this cheap grace that we have? Um, how is it conducive to the universalistic spirit? And, and how would you contrast that with, with the cheap grace or with the costly grace? Well, uh, of course, the, the phrases go back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his marvelous little Cost. book that I highly recommend called The Cost of Discipleship. And one of the most interesting things he says about cheap grace, he says cheap grace is the grace that we give ourselves. It's actually not grace from God. It's basically saying my sin really wasn't so bad. I'm really not that bad. And so the first thing that cheap grace does was to minimize the depth of our sin. And thereby, to go back to Gerald's point, it actually minimizes the grace of God. Because yeah. if my sin is not that serious, right. then I don't really need that. I need a little, I don't need a bucket of grace. I need a couple drops, you know, that will be perfectly sufficient for me. Thank you very much. Right. So uh, cheap, in Cheap Grace, he describes it with a series of, of statements saying it's, it's the um, Christian life without discipleship. It's faith without repentance. It's Christianity without the cross. One of the very characteristic things of, of, uh, of a cheap grace approach to Christianity is the elimination of the cross. We see this actually in some churches, the cross being taken down, removed, uh, a lack of references to the cross, a sort of celebration of triumph, of success, but turning our attention away from this gory, unsightly, unseemly image of the bleeding man Jesus nailed to the piece of wood. That's not, the cross is not a message that affirms our, our ideas of ourself as really okay, as, uh, as, as complete, as sufficient, because it tells us that, that we're not, and that, that Christ by his suffering um, has, is the one who's redeemed us. What are some of the other practices? In, in the lecture yesterday, you mentioned evangelism. Yeah, that, that's uh, a key one, one. Once we lose the doctrine of hell and um, the eternal judgment of God, we have no need to proclaim the gospel. What are some of the other practices um, in the church that, 
that will be marginalized or neglected? I'd have to think, you know, I haven't been in a, <laughs> in a church that just denied the doctrine of hell, but I would just have to think that scripture is going to be, like preaching is going to be handled differently mm -hmm. because you, you either are going to be starting to do Marcy and stuff and like leave out the Old Testament because that's unbecoming of God or this is just the Jewish revelation and it's not really accurate to what really happened or, um, which I think is what you see. I mean, you see that in, in, in a McLaren perhaps and others where like it's, it's a whole reworking of scripture and that's mm -hmm. going to ultimately result in a reworking of preaching as well. You just can't mm -hmm. preach the Bible as mm -hmm. it is and not talk about the wrath of God. So I think that's going to be a big one too. Mm -hmm. In, in McLaren's book, A Generous Orthodoxy, he at one point mentions hell, and then within a page or two, the reference to hell becomes the hell question. And the first time I read this in this book, I was, it was my first encounter with McLaren's writing. I thought, well, this is really curious. How did hell suddenly become the hell question? And then later he says that he doesn't agree with the view called exclusivism, nor with the view called inclusivism. His view doesn't fit in any of those. And so it seems like what he ends up with is a kind of tentativeness uh, and ambiguity. And it reminds me a little bit of what George Marsden said about a 19th century preacher, that he preached charity at the price of clarity. And I think that's something that we're seeing in some of the churches that are flirting with universalism is a ambiguity uh, in, on a lot of basic doctrines, and even sometimes a celebration of ambiguity, that the, you know, that the further you go in the Christian life, it's alleged the more ambiguous, the more uncertain you become. Well, that's a, that seems to be uh, a, a culturally uh, you know, popular idea, but not one that I see uh, uh, that is expressed in scripture. So, and, and then also we, we just see in, uh, we see a tortured exegesis in some cases to try to reconcile the New Testament with the universalist message. Robin Perry, published originally under a pseudonym, Gregory MacDonald, in his book, The Evangelical Universalist, when he gets to the lake of fire in the book of Revelation, he says, and this, this is in common with other universalists, the lake of fire is God himself. And so those who are thrown in the lake of fire are purified in God. And then he said, trying to reconcile that interpretation with the last chapter of, of Revelation, that they come purified out of the lake of fire, and then they go and wash their robes and they enter through the gates into the city. Well, it's, uh, he's doing exegetical somersaults yeah. to try to make everything work out. It just isn't. And you look at the larger narrative of Revelation, it's the story of the, of the world becoming hardened against God, and then the, finally the judgment on, on Babylon and then on the kings of the earth comes. So uh, I think we do have to touch on evangelism at least briefly here because this clearly is one of the areas that's most directly affected by a universalist belief. Um, there is no urgency of going out to, to preach Christ. And when you think about the alternative to that, a biblical mindset, in the biblical view, the choices that we make now in time and in earthly terms have eternal consequences. And, and that invests even the smallest thing that I do with such tremendous significance. And the alternative to that, ironically, in the name of inclusiveness, the universalist evacuates our decision. Every decision is now can be reversed later or will be reversed eventually. Karl Barth, who, if not a directly universal, at least move, thought moved in that direction, suggested that evangelism was simply going out to announce to people that they had already be, been reconciled to God. It wasn't actually calling people to make any decision. And that had a major um, impact on the mainline churches all through the middle decades of the 20th century and even up to the present day. Um, we can directly trace the decline of evangelistic urgency and missionary activity of the mainline to some of these ideas. For Bart, there were just two categories of people, those who were reconciled and knew that they were reconciled and those who were reconciled and didn't yet know.